So who we've got on the panel, we have, um, let me just get my, we have at the end Craig Morantz, serial entrepreneur and angel investor, entrepreneur in residence of the Toronto Ryerson Futures, startup advisor at Digital Media Zone and CEO of Kira Talent. In the middle, we have uh, Don Pare or Don Pa? Yes, Don Pare. Don Pare, chairman of RV Capital. Uh, he's been CEO of a number of different companies and achieved several high-profile exits over his 40 years of experience. And then next to me, we've got Mike Volker, uh, who most of you probably saw yesterday, serial entrepreneur and angel investor, director of uh, Simon Fraser's in Innovation Office and director of the National Angel Capital Organization. And myself, Director of Financial Services at IDEV International, based in Peru. So, the first question that we're going to pose to the angels. Um, our blessed angels in, in residence here. So, a angel investing is a very, it's a very personal thing. Each, uh, each angel investor looks for a different thing in line with their, their, their kind of speciality and what they know about. And so, what I'd kind of, the question I'd pose to, to each of you is, across your portfolio of companies, for each one, what do you look for in the particular companies that you're looking to invest in? So if you're looking across your portfolio, what do all of those companies have in common, if you could say that they have anything particularly in common? Or may not have in common? So let me uh, they're all really good at losing money. That's the number one trait for all of them. They can spend a lot of money. Uh, what, what I have, you know, it's taken a long time to perfect it, but it's all about the people. So um, I wish I had a test, that DNA test that uh, we just saw. Um, but I really, it, it's, it's the people first, because if, there, if the product doesn't work, the, you can change a product. You can't change the people. So really my first thing is getting to know the people for as long as possible before I give them money. So th that's why networking is really important for me and connecting with people and getting to know people because I may not invest with them right now. I may invest with them in two years, three years, five years, but I want to get to know them and see how they uh, make decisions. Uh, are there specific types of products that you'd invest in? I mean, I'm assuming you don't invest in products that you don't understand or you feel the risks you don't understand properly. Yeah, I mean, and I've said that to some people that I've met here. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't get your business, so I'm, I'm probably not a good fit, and then I send them to you. And, uh, and not I say I'm not a good fit either. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you know, sometimes I'm okay when I don't understand the product when the person really impresses me because I, I can't be an expert in all, in all areas. Yeah. And so I look at it as also it can be an expensive way to, l to learn a new uh, vertical, but sometimes I'll be willing to put money into uh, a company that I don't fully understand the market. So I can't be as valuable, but I'm just really impressed with the entrepreneurs. And part of that, I suppose, is going to be the messaging from the entrepreneurs to you, making you feel like you know more yes. about their product, yeah. rather than if you don't understand the messaging and you don't understand the product, then you're definitely not going to invest. Yeah. yeah. So, Don, yourself? Well, it's good to come second because uh, Craig said everything I was going to say. <laughs> um, I love the entrepreneur spirit that's here. You know, I've seen a... a a great group of companies presenting to me in the pitch session. And nothing short of being on par or even better than many I've seen elsewhere in the world. So that's, uh, I also look for people, um, but in addition to them being passionate and driven, I'm looking for two other qualities. One is persistence. And, you know, let's take, for example, the people, Marianne, who ran this session. I mean, we lost power. We, <laughs> you know, pretty well anything that could have happened to go wrong happened, yet it kept going forward with the magic. I look for that type of quality in an entrepreneur, that they're, they're going to hit some bumps in the road. Are they prepared to hang in there, commit, and, and work their way around it? The other thing that's very important to me is the... Uh, that they take the high moral ground. Sometimes it's easy, easy when you're uh, trying to get a venture done to cut corners on what I would say acting uh, in a proper moral moral way. And I, I don't want to get behind a company that's, that, that doesn't have a high moral perspective. 
it's very, very important. And apart from that, um, do they understand their market? Have they lived in their market? Do they have clients in their market? Are they in the know? Are they in the market? I find sometimes people can build a monument to the god without any involvement from a client or your channel. And that doesn't work well. You want to get customers involved right at the get-go, right at the start, to help guide what you do and how you do it. So, I mean, by that you mean you've got to understand the end consumer's incentives for buying your product and distribution to market of actually getting it to the right type of product, the right type of consumers? I'll answer for him. Uh, I think what he meant, just that there's domain expertise. It's Sometimes people will have amazing ideas, but they have no experience in that vertical. And that's a little bit scary. When somebody's coming in and saying, like, I've worked five years in retail, and I've seen the pain of you know using a POS, and I created this new POS system. So they might not have tech experience, but they have domain experience. I, yeah. Is that what you meant to say? Absolutely. <laughs> but never as well as you just did. Um, and was there any other questions? Shall we, shall, shall we let On the IVG mic. OK, great. Yeah, all of the above. But what's important for me when I look at an entrepreneur is, is he or she coachable? Are they willing to learn? Are they willing to listen? You know, after having been in this business for over 30 years as, a, as an investor, um, what I've learned is that I know very little. And so when I look at an entrepreneur and they think they know everything, that scares me because there's just so much to know. So they have to be coachable, willing to listen. I've had bad experiences with a few sociopaths that I've invested in. And um, they can be big trouble because they're very convincing, they're very sociable, very friendly but they can be very, very dangerous and they can destroy companies. So I try to avoid them, but I do have a DNA test, Greg. Uh, what I do, and this is, this is my little secret formula, I'm very lucky and what I do is I bring them home for dinner with my wife. And after the evening, if she says, Mike, he's a jerk, then I don't invest. Because I'll get taken by the technology and by the idea and the opportunity. And I think, this is such a great idea. I've got to put my money in it. And Jesus, but he's an idiot. Don't invest your money in that idiot. And I listen to her. And when I've done that, I've done well. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we come across a lot of... A lot of uh, uh, well, you know, women, women are more... Sensitive, sensitive. Yeah. They're, they're, they're better at, here, here. at the social qualities, right? Guys tend to be technical, we want to fix problems, and we don't get into the touchy-feely things. That's a comprehensive test. So I had dinner with your wife last night. What did she say? Uh, I was sitting across from her, so I don't know so if she... Far, so okay. So, I mean, we come across a lot of, a lot of small, medium-sized businesses, and they are, I would say, on average, you know, Four, five hundred thousand dollars in revenue and, and below, and then you know quite a lot of them are saying, "Well, I want five million dollars or ten million dollars," and they kind of shoot for the stars and what they're looking for. Would you say that? Um, I mean, pragmatism is something that you would recommend more entrepreneurs kind of use more more kind of more on a daily basis, or is it something that you actually want them to shoot for the stars and then you're trying to kind of bring them down to earth? Well, yeah, I, I like them to go to think big. I mean, you know, we need to get our 10x returns, right? And we're not going to get them if they don't think big. So I'd rather gamble, build a big company, you know, really get involved with somebody who's very ambitious. And, and, and I think that's good. I mean, even if they don't hit that particular goal, even if they get halfway there, that's great. So amb ambition is very, very important and having those lofty goals and and... The, the, the tenacity and the persistence to pursue those goals, so important. I completely agree with him, Mike. In fact, I think we have to separate in our mind the difference between a forecast and a goal. Because that's what people get confused on. They're not asking you for a, some sort of a counting level three forecast here. They're asking you for what is your goals in your time frame. Some people would say the time frame is two years. Some would say it's three years. A, a number of them would say maybe four or five years, depending on how, the, how long it takes for a venture. But if you've got a goal, 
it's surprising how that goal can help you move forward in a proper way. If you don't set that ambitious goal, you might just kind of go around in circles. And they're looking for, okay, if that goal is there, if you've got an ambitious goal, what do you need to get there? They want to hear that. What are the five key things you're going to do? Not just operations, but what are the five key things you're going to do to actually take your company up to that goal? Because funny enough, if you get the money, you know what, where, what you have to do to get there, and you have support from guys who can add tremendous value like Craig and uh, Mike, the odds are you're going to do pretty darn good. So I think one of the things you said is, you know, a company that's doing a couple hundred thousand or half a million dollars and they want to raise two, three, four, or five million, is that, is that asking for too much? And for me, what I look at is if they've figured out where to put the fuel on the fire, so w if they've gotten to half a million, they've probably figured out what channel they should be spending money on. So they've already figured out using these words in an AdWords campaign gets us a 10 times return on the investment. Then I think it's okay to ask for four or five million dollars. But if you're asking for four to five million dollars just because you want to hire a bunch of people to then figure it out, that's a problem for me. I'll, I, I don't mind giving more money if they've already, it's simply to put fuel on the fire. Yeah, and, th and they need to think about where they're actually going to be spending that money yeah, rather than just coming up with numbers. And that's why I like dinner. really scrappy startups that, you know, um, with a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, they've figured out uh, how to grow their business. They they spend that first amount of money figuring out how to grow their business, and then they spend the the big amount of money on actually growing the business. Yeah. So, kind of taking a step back from from your portfolios and what you're you know specifically focused on, you're all um, heavily invested in the angel infrastructure activity in Canada. And so just looking at that panorama, what do you think has contributed to the angel investment infrastructure in Canada being so strong? Is it economic policy from the government? Is it putting in an ecosystem of supportive institutions? Are there any particular things that have happened over the last 10, 15 years that you think have helped um, develop that ecosystem? Sure, well, okay. The, the, the most important thing is successful outcomes. So when we've had some really good exits, um, that does two things. It creates more millionaires who can now invest and become angels. And um, it's also uh, a good story to attract people into that activity. So that's really important. You know, when I started the first network in Vancouver over 15 years ago, and it was a handful of angel investors who were able to write checks. Uh, now it's, uh, you know, hundreds. We've now got hundreds of, of angel investors, and that's all been evolutionary. I don't think these things happen overnight. You have to give them a little bit of time for, for that to develop at, at a regional and local level. Just one comment, because, again, Mike is um, dead on the money here. <laughs> I'm going to be saying that a lot in the middle here. You know, Craig's right. You're right. You can go first uh, next I'll time. smile, right? <laughs> But uh, I think something that Mike alluded to should be emphasized, and that is networking is really what's causing a lot of things to happen. Uh, more people are getting together. Angels feel better about going into deals if they have someone else alongside them, right, Mike? And um, it makes it easier to look at some of the deals if you have somebody else to bounce some concerns, and, uh, and they might even have some value added. So the networking concept is really helpful. And there's a number of people who have done incredible things in, in building networks. I mean, we heard from, uh, Vic, you know, from, from, from Victoria, and she was saying to us, you know, how she's starting uh, Startup Canada, right? And how it's about networking and it's about getting people together and trying to focus on, on, on actually getting something done. That's a key word. So you're all part of Angel Networks then, and you basically try and go in and, and co-invest with a number of different investors. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that's happening is this is, this is going to accelerate more. We're actually at the beginning of a lot of the 
um, growth in angel investing for a whole bunch of reasons. One of the biggest reasons in the United States, where I do a lot of my work, is the uh, job, Jobs Act Title II has allowed investors to solicit angels and accredited investors directly. Uh, so you're, you're finding that things like angel list, you know, have a whole bunch of angels on it, and people can actually go and see how many investments they've made and what their interest is. So again, the networking. Um, I don't know if you know this, but one of the biggest investment sites in the world, does anybody know what it is? You're gonna probably say India, go, go, or Kickstarter. LinkedIn, LinkedIn. It's taking top spot in connecting angels and accredited investors to a deal. Opening up doors nobody thought about. For example, a health company I was working with went to LinkedIn and found 50 doctors that might be interested in what they were doing. They brought them into a room and they walked away with a million bucks. All through LinkedIn. So this is going to accelerate. You have Gust. You've probably heard of Gust. Some, some people want to put their venture on AngelList even if they're not going to use AngelList because it's a way to say, hey, my, my venture is there. So we're in a very disruptive, and just as we thought the Angel Network was kind of coming together, somebody comes up with this crowdfunding idea. Well, you hear more about that later on. And, and so a question I've got, I mean, it's about networks and it's also about comfort in the environment where you're investing. And so being, you know, understanding the investment landscape in Canada, for example, or in, in North America generally, and, and that the rules, you understand the investing rules, how you can get money out of your investment and all those types of things. What do you, do, do any of you have investments outside of the US or Canada? I do not. Just US and Canada. So seeing as we're, we're now down in Chile, quite a long way from the U.S. and Canada. What, what <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to bring this home, this 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 panel. Um, what um, what do you, I mean? What are the differences that you're going to that you think? What are the hurdles, the difficulties that you kind of foresee in investing in somewhere like Chile, coming from coming from the U.S. and Canada? The rules are completely different. The cultures are completely different. The the I mean, I'm not saying we're very investing in somewhere like Asia, where the cultures are completely, completely different. There, there are similarities, but there are cultural differences here. There are different bureaucracy here. What do you think would be the kind of key hurdles for you coming down to make an investment in somewhere like Chile or, or Peru or Colombia or basically anywhere south of uh, the States? Cultures are different. We had dinner at 10.30 last night. That was uh, <laughs> very difficult. Yeah, you did not look yeah, happy. I was not happy <laughs> with that. Uh, so, you know, generally you'll hear from investors, they like to be able to, uh, especially angels, they like to be able to drive to their, you know, they won't invest outside of two or three hours of, of where they live, which makes sense because if you're going to be on the board, you're going to be an advisor, you know, if there's a, a, a big challenge that they need to sit down with you, uh, that makes sense. Having said that, I think we all came down here looking for something looking for a competitive advantage. So can we get in on something that, you know, w if we fly 12 or 14 hours to get here, there's a lot of people that aren't going to do that. Uh, so I think it's looking for a competitive advantage. And it just means that there's gonna have to be an overcompensation in communication. Um, to me, it's more, there's the local culture, or there's the local challenges of getting a business up and running, but for me, it's around communication. If I'm going to be able to be helpful, I can still do that over Skype. Um, we can still have advisory talks, um, but it, it's it's a higher risk. It's definitely a higher risk. So looking for something that's, you know, some of the, some of the things that I've seen the last couple of days are just copycats of what's already being done in North America for the Latin American market, which is great. But that's uh, that's not a that's. That's too risky for me. Uh, I'm looking for something that's being done down here that isn't being done in North America or Europe yet. Yeah. 
And there's a lot of work that you'd have to do up front to feel comfortable in actually investing in the legal structures and things that down, down here as well. So what I want to do is, um, first of all, how many of you have heard of the Koretsu Forum? Just one or two? Okay, so Koretsu, and that's Japanese word spelled K-E-I, K-R-E-T-S-U. Koretsu is an international angel network. It has chapters in key cities around the world, and I run the chapter in Vancouver. And so what we want to do more of is global syndications. So for example, if there's a company, if there's a chapter in Paris, let's say, and there's a company there that's being funded by angel investors, it gets its first support from those local investors, as, as Craig mentioned, where they are, it's a contact sport. But then we get the opportunity, other members of that network see that opportunity. They see that 500,000 has been invested by local angels in a $1 million deal. And then they can invest the other half million and they're really piggybacking on that company and riding the shoulders of that company and those investors that are local. So this is a way to get exposure to global deals. So in Vancouver, for example, we're seeing more and more deals out of Silicon Valley because there's always that feeling that, well, all the action is down there and we're missing the boat as angel investors. So now we get to see those deals. And similarly, our companies get exposed to investors down in the valley. So that's just a start. And I think we can do that on a global scale. So for example, if a chapter of Koretsu or something like that were created in Santiago or in Buenos Aires or wherever, then that would be the first step to, to doing that. And then angel investors are comfortable with that because they, you know, they, they, they work together, they trust each other. And I think that's the way uh, to make that happen. The other thing that I'd like to do personally is, so if I've got companies in certain sectors, like especially where machinery and equipment is involved. Um, IT is a little different because it's so easy to download applications and you don't necessarily need people on the ground in different countries. But if I have a wastewater treatment system, for example, that I've invested in and there's opportunity for that technology in a local market, wouldn't it be great if that company that I've invested in in Canada was partnering with a company in Chile and there were local investors in Canada investing in both companies and in Chile investors investing in both of those companies. Then we'd have that collaboration and co-investment and we'd be on our way to building global companies. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, a, like a fantastic idea. Have you had, actually had much exposure to local Chilean investors since you've been down here? Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a great experience. Made some excellent connections here. And, With and, a, and a it's number a of the local yeah. angels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So would that be something, I mean, it sounds like one, you need, um, I mean, just for the, for the kind of practical point of doing due diligence, it's a lot more difficult doing due diligence from Canada. You have to do the flights down and that can take a bit of time and it can make a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar investment yeah. significantly but, but, more But you're expensive. relying on the locals to you're do relying the due on the diligence. Locals, exactly. Like for example, and if anyone's interested, <coughs> I can show you an example of this in the Koretsu forum. The key thing that's making that successful is the due diligence process and they have a standard um, process that you go through and a report, usually 50 to 100 page report is produced. It's almost like a prospectus. And then that is available. Usually a core group of five or six really interested angels will do that and then they will invest, put their money, and then that report, that due diligence report, is available to the global network. And you can read it and the due diligence is done. Yeah. And, and then you're really just making a bet. So would you say, I mean, anybody looking to get in a kind of do a club deal or get in a number of different angels involved in, in expanding their business, um, would you say one of the first steps would be try and attract local investors, try and attract local angels, and then see if you can use those local angels mm -hmm. as a kind of stepping point onto in, more into the international investor space? Yeah, absolutely. I just can't see myself, for example, just jumping in unless it's absolutely mind-boggling and compelling. Yeah. I just couldn't see writing a check to a local company uh, because of just the practical issues of, of distance and knowledge and culture and language and all those things. But if a colleague here is writing a check or if a group of people are writing a check, then I just piggyback on top of them and I could do that. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then um, 
we're going to go into some, some audience questions in a minute, but I've got one final question. We're kind of moving into the, like, the investing dating scene. And so you know, in angel investing, the, the businesses are bringing to the table their great opportunity, their idea, they're about to be the next Google or whatever. What do you three... As, as individual angel investors bring to the table? What, you, know, you, you bring money, obviously that's pretty important, but what on top of that money do you bring to the table if you're trying to kind of sell yourselves to the businesses so that they kind of will go with you rather than another angel investor? Well, I, I think you've prepared some great questions here, Patrick. <laughs> I'm glad we asked you to do Are this. Are you wearing a shorter skirt than the other angel it, investor it, down it, the road? Uh, <laughs> so um, one of the points is, um, and please raise your hands, how many people here have a good idea of what an angel investor is? And you see, us angels should be more sensitive to that, really, because that's interesting. I, um, I had a meeting with a group today, and although they had a market that was outside of where I was, like Craig was saying, something I couldn't help them with, I said, but there's an obvious answer to get your money looked at me and I said, what do you think an angel is? And they said, well, it's, it's like, a, a, like a venture company, but one person. That, that's what they had the idea. And we know it's changing. The institutions have moved up and, and more conservative. The venture companies have moved up to more late stage businesses. It's harder to find an early stage venture firm. But I said, no, an angel by definition, and Mike alluded to this, is somebody who has probably hit a home run. One. And two, it's been in a market similar to where you are, and he understands the market. And three, he can be passionate. So this company is selling a doctor application, an application for doctors. I've seen a number of them in the US and Canada. And they're trying to get it fun funded and off the ground here. And I said, well, get a room like this, smaller, and invite 40 well-to-do doctors. And ask them if they'd like to take a position after they've heard your presentation and the doctor, the senior doctor that's on the board. And you'll likely walk away with the amount of money that you're asking for right away. And one of the comments he made said, well, they, they won't invest, they did not. Now that may be a cultural difference here because sometimes, you know, people don't invest, they, they do it through an investment management firm. But what's happening is that's changing. The disintermediation that's happening today is I had one firm that sat down had 15 doctors in the room and walked away with $750,000 pledged and closed in two weeks. And that was it. So angels can be super angels like, like Craig is, and, but Craig also has passion. And his passion is in a few areas that he knows about. Oh, I think you have passion, Craig. You know, you're not, come on, show some passion, Craig. But we're passionate like you, and it's interesting. You get two passionate people. I was very passionate about some of the presentations I heard today. They're exciting. I heard you. Oh, you heard me getting passionate? Get excited, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, so um, <laughs> what, what I bring to the table uh, to answer the question um, is just one, really one thing, and that's connections. That's the main thing. I have a lot of connections. I don't think I'm very smart, but I know a lot of smart people. And I can connect those smart people to the startup companies and sit back and watch things happen. Okay. What was the question? What do we bring to the yeah, what do, what do you bring to the table? <laughs> I'm very passionate. passionate. I'm very passionate. <laughs> I'm actually not, I'm not passionate. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm angry. That's what I bring to the table. I make sure uh, I hold them accountable. And I think that's a lot of times what startups don't have the discipline is sometimes they've done it, sometimes they haven't done it. But what I really try to do is bring a lot of accountability and discipline to the table. So um, yes, here's some money, but I'm going to hold your feet to the fire to help you 
be better at what you already are. Because most of the times, and I've heard it from the, I'm investing in people that are smarter than me in a certain area. And my job is to bring out more of that in them. So I just, I really try to push them hard uh, in the hopes that they will go deeper into what they're, what they're already passionate about and what they're really good at. So kind of you, 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 you each bring to the table your own speciality and, and, and Mike, you bring a, a wealth of knowledge of contacts and, and basically helping them get in contact with the right people. One, I, just one last question before we, we take to the audience is um, one of the key differences, so I, I mean, I work in Peru, which is very, very different to the, to the States and Canada with regards to setting up a business, getting product to market, the type of product you're getting out to market and the type of consumers that you're getting it to. And one of the things that we, uh, and I'm from the UK, which is it's a lot easier to do business there than it is in Peru, trust me, um, is the lead time in getting from setting your business up to getting it to market to actually monetizing it, you know, the amount of money that's available, the bureaucracy, just the different hurdles and obstacles of getting a business up and scaling it takes a significant amount of time. Even if it's a great idea, it takes a significant amount of time you know, longer than it would in, in, in a slightly more fluid market. That has an implication for a lot of funds coming into the market. You know, they've got like a 10-year cycle and they need to get out beforehand. They can't do that in a lot of these early stage businesses. And it will mean that you're, you have an illiquid investment for a you know, significantly longer period of time. Do you think that has an implication on whether, you know, the number of angel investors that would like to get involved in these types of markets? Or do you think an angel investor be, you know, happy to invest in that kind of market if they think it's a good idea and just stay the course um, for as long as it takes to actually get their money out of the investment? Well, that's a serious downer to end the uh, talk on. Um, <laughs> I'll try to raise it up for that. I, I, I think, yeah, passion, passion. Uh, it's going to just be more looking for more reward for more risk. So um, I would just go back to what Mike said. I'm hopefully going to find somebody on the ground here or wherever that can um, accelerate those local challenges. That's what I'd be doing. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, audience, is it, does the audience have any questions? I don't think we've got any microphones left. Hi, thanks. Um, great everything. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you guys are obviously here. You have no investments in Latin America, um, but you're here, so you're interested. Um, you're talking about an upside, a competitive advantage. Uh, my question is, are you getting on a plane tomorrow to Europe and Asia, or are you really looking at Latin America as a first opportunity outside of the U.S. and Canada? I mean, what's your perspective um, versus other markets? I've spent the last five years or so visiting countries all over the world and participating in local angel meetings um, to compare how things are done in, in the different areas. And everywhere I go, I'm impressed. You know, the entrepreneurial spirit is just so global. And even though the bureaucracy, the political environment, government regulations are different from country to country, it's that entrepreneurial zeal that is so appealing. And um, I, I don't have a bias for one area over another. Um, so for me, it's, uh, it, it, it's the individual and, and the team and, and the business in a particular country. So I, w I wouldn't say I'm, I've targeted any particular areas. I mean, to be honest, closer to home is always a little better just because it's more convenient. So. As Craig alluded, if you go further afield, the reward's got to be commensurate with that extra step that you take to go further afield. But it's, it's global, and, and I'm really encouraged by what I see globally. And I think that's why our Karetsu Forum um, is turning into a, a global network, because, you know, the smartest guy... Where is the smartest guy in the world, or the smartest lady in the world? Where are they? If you tell me that, then that's the country I'll go to. Hi, 
Um, I have a very simple question I would like to ask you. Um, if you were uh, not investors but startups and you were sitting in front of an investor, how would you like to start a conversation? Thank you. I'm about to raise four million dollars, so I, I have to, I have to do that. <coughs> um, the conversation needs to start with, for me, is what is the problem, and is the problem small? Is the problem? I said this yesterday in my presentation. Are you solving a problem that requires painkillers or just vitamins? And I want so if if. Um, trying to remember your exact question and, and whether I'm, I'm being the startup or the investor. But when I'm going to go out and present, I'm going to make it very clear to the investors that we're solving a painful problem. And I'm going to demonstrate the pain by showing them how my customer right now or what they're doing, what they did before and what they did after. And we've actually had investors come to our office and we've done Skype calls with customers and said, explain to us what you did before using our product and explain what your life's like now using our product. If an investor can hear that firsthand, besides one of these fancy polished videos that look like they were produced in a studio, I mean, yeah, just keep it, keep it simple. Like People just want to know what the problem was, how did you solve it, and what, what is life like now that the problem's solved. Well, I was going to add a story. Do you want to hear a story? I love stories. Being, a, being, a, being a, an, an entrepreneurial person myself, I was the CEO of a company in Edmonton called Messaging Direct. And when I came to take, take, take it over, it was kind of in the dumps, $800,000 loss, and they were trying to compete with Microsoft with an email client. But inside that company, there was something precious. There was a technology that could be used in an upcoming market called bill presentment. You go to your bank site, you see your, you see your statements and bills. Well, this company invented that. Now, when I was going to get money, I'm talking from your perspective here because I've, I've been there. When I was going to get money, I was into Toronto, Toronto and I really... Uh, believe in what Craig's saying. I'm talking about here's the problem, you know, the, the, the paper waste, the management of trying to make, so on and so on. And they took me to one investor, and I came in with my slides and my diagrams and everything. And he sat down and we talked about family and the world. And after half an hour, he said, Good to meet you. And I went out and I said, really failed here. Anyways, the fellow who was with me, who was making the introductions, went, went in to thank him, and he came out with a check for $1.5 I said, what was all that about? He said, well, this guy invests based on who you are and how you think. He'd already looked at the product. He understands that, but his reasoning for that was that so it was just amazing and, and that's good if you have the time for that but getting back to your question about the proverbial elevator pitch you've only got so much time to get your point across and what i find if entrepreneurs are pitching me it takes them too long to tell me what that problem is so craig's point is first and the second thing i like to hear is what les was talking about yesterday what's in it for me you know as an investor what am i going to get out of it and when, you know, so is who's going to buy this company and in what time frame? Or how, how am I going to how am I going to make money and how much am I going to make and when? So I want to hear that. And so the entrepreneur should be thinking a little bit about what the investor wants to hear as well. Les has a question. Speaking of Les. Well, Like, so we can structure a conversation. And, and, and we'd like to 
Absolutely. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, you, all you have to do is contact the NSA. <laughs> and you can find a whole bunch of things. But yeah, um, and this is where a platform like LinkedIn, some people like it, some people don't, right? But in link, LinkedIn, if the person manages it well, it's going to help you understand the vision, mission, and background, and expertise, and interests. A lot of good stuff. Now, I'd say only about 7 or 8% of the people on LinkedIn today know how to use LinkedIn. Okay. One of the things is I give a talk on how to use LinkedIn to raise money. And, uh, you know, there is a way to create a brand there and get to know investors and get to understand them and talk to, to them. Sometimes face-to-face -face is hard, but there are tools out there like uh, video conferencing where someone can get a feel for who you are and what you are. I'd say in the last 30 years, the concept of being close to the investor was paramount. So you got angels saying, I've got to be able to drive there. But I'm seeing a remarkable trend towards people investing in places that are four, five, six hours flights. Now 12 or 15 hours with three stopovers and a six hour wait time without food can be a challenge. And so I might, I might pass, but uh, um, it's, it is changing. There we go. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you're seeing from uh, early startups uh, when they're trying to find investment or money? What are the main problems you're seeing? Your answer will be too long. I'll, um, <laughs> let me just, uh, I think the number one thing is they haven't figured out yet. I know this is going back to what I spoke about yesterday, but they haven't even figured out what their product, what problem their product really solves. So they end up explaining for five to 10 minutes what they do and they lose the investor right away. An investor, you, you gotta, it's just like your website. So they're, gonna, they're gonna bounce within a couple of seconds if you can't explain the problem that you solve, how big the market size is and the strength of your team. That's what they wanna know. They wanna know about your team, the problem you solve, and the size of the opportunity. Oh no, very concise. Uh, one, one common mistake I find is um, uh, competition. They, they, they don't know enough about the competition. They, you know, and when they say there is no competition, that's really worrisome because they're obviously, obviously solving a problem for which there's some kind of solution present, but it's just not a good enough solution. So I get really worried when they say there's no competition. It's funny, a lot of our presentations, I'm sitting there in the audience listening to uh, companies come and do their pitches, and as they're speaking, I'm Googling words that they say. And then I'll ask them a question during the Q&A. I said, you know about company X that I've just Googled? And they look at me kind of puzzled. And that's, that's a real red flag because it means they haven't done that homework. It's like when you get a patent, you know, you have to do extensive search for prior art. And when you start a company, you have to do extensive work on, on competition. You know, who else is, is doing this kind of thing? Um, that, that's, a, that's a common shortcoming that I see when, when I hear presentations. It's a wrap. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, everybody.